Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Tonight, we're continuing our theme of exploring pediatric kidney disease. My friend Emily Whitaker is on the show tonight. She, is a, she has a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and is a caseworker and a social worker. More importantly, she is the mother of a six-year-old boy, Henry. Henry is a pediatric kidney patient who had a kidney transplant at Riley's Children's Hospital on his fourth birthday. That's a heck of a birthday present, isn't it? And we're going to talk to her tonight about the ups and downs of uh, being a pediatric kidney patient mom and, like her, and uh, find out what's going on with her son. So please welcome Emily to the show. Hello, Emily. How are you? Hi, Jim. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, do me a favor. Uh, tell me your name and spell your last name for us, please. Yeah. With a little different spelling. It is. It is. So um, thank you so much for having me on tonight. It's great to be here. Happy Thanksgiving. Um, my name Happy is Emily Whitaker, and it's W-H-I-T-A-C-R-E. Um, so it's actually I ironic and a little funny that you say that it's a, a different spelling because in my town where I'm from, actually every Whitaker that I know is spelled the way that we spell it. So, but oh. I hear that all the time that it's like not a common spelling. Okay. That that's from Huntington, Indiana. Yeah. Is that yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah. What, what is your occupation now? Um, I'm a mental health professional by trade. So social worker, um, I've done everything from, um, behavioral clinician working with with kiddos. Most of the demographic that I've worked with is with child and adolescents. Um, so behavioral skills, life skills. Um, I'm a, a social worker, caseworker, case manager, um, cord all around coordinator. Um, that's kind of where I fall. My biggest title is just a coordination or coordinator of services. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to put my point extra on tonight. I got smart ladies on with me. So. <laughs> Are you a married lady? 
I am indeed. Yes. Uh, my husband and I have been married for about two years now. Um, Kevin, we've been together for much longer than that. Um, but we have, yes, two littles. So there's our Henry and then our sweet, I promise you, she is sweet, not based on that picture. Um, but our sweet Gertrude, our little, our littlest there. Um, so yeah, we've been married going on two years coming up here in about three weeks, actually. Oh, congratulations. Happy early anniversary and all Thank that. Thank you so much. And Jim, I got to tell you, look who stopped by to say hello. Henry, how are you, buddy? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Camera shy. Figured that would happen. <laughs> must, have been, must have been something I said. <laughs> well, we're is... going to spend, we're gonna okay. spend most of the night talking about Henry. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about Gigi. Oh, Gigi. She is our spitfire. She is 100% the opposite of everything that Henry ever was. So in every way that Henry was timid and shy, uh, he, she is the exact opposite. Uh, she is fearless and sometimes a little reckless and dangerous. Uh, she definitely keeps us on her toes. Uh, she'll be 18 months here next week, actually. So year and a half. We are not quite into the terrible twos yet. Okay, and I think I read Henry is six. Yes, he'll be six and a half in two weeks, actually. So, yeah, he's doing oh, great. Oh, wow. Birthday yeah. coming up soon. Um, let's, let, let's talk about uh, Henry. Uh, approximately when did you discover that you were pregnant? Um, it was in the fall of 2013. Um, and just kind of knew, right? When you're a woman, I, that's what you hear is that you, you just kind of know. And so I took a test and sure enough, yep. Um, and we were thrilled. We were really excited, super excited. Um, and yeah, then everything went really smoothly for the first um, like three months. And then uh, we went in for a, a routine ultrasound and, and that's kind of when things got a little scary, a little wonky. <laughs> okay, tell us what, what happened. That was an 18th week checkup if I remember right. Yeah, 16, 16 and a half, actually. Yeah. Um, okay. And so it was very much like a movie, a scene from a Lifetime movie almost. Uh, we went in for a routine appointment. It was at the in the afternoon, the end of the day. And um, our nurse was so sweet. And she said, you know, well, you know what? You're far enough along. Would you like to get in for an ultrasound to see, you know, your little peanut? And we, of course, said yes. You know, we weren't supposed to that day, but we thought, of course, gosh, yes, we want to. Um, and we really thank God for that because that is that is when we found the issues. So uh, we definitely believe that that was a God-driven moment, and we mm -hmm. give thanks for that. What what kind of issues did you discover? What are we talking about? Well, the they didn't tell us much at that initial finding. Um, it was very surreal. You know, the, the technician started the ultrasound and then she stopped and she said, you know, I'm going to tell them not to go leave at the lab because you have to have your blood work done, which was true. Um, and so, but then she left and, and she said, um, and I'm almost, I'm also going to grab the doctor and she grabbed the doctor. And as soon as she left the room, I told Kevin, you know, he was with me and I said, something's not right because she wouldn't just start the ultrasound and then stop it and go get a doctor. So um, they, at that point in time, they told us they had found a mass basically in his stomach is what they thought they were seeing. Um, and so we went to a high risk doctor here in Fort Wayne with kind of that same assumption. And he actually referred us then to Cincinnati Children's Hospital, um, with at that point in time, what we thought was a gastric issue. They actually thought it was a mass that had formed in his stomach. Um, once we got to Cincinnati, then we found out that it was not in fact his stomach. It was his, that mass that they saw was actually his bladder that had distended. And on the ultrasound picture, um, the, the mass, his bladder was actually larger than his head. So it was, it was immensely distended and so much larger than it should have been. Okay. And, and what did you learn about that mass? What, what was unusual about it? Um, it was, well, number one, not supposed to be there because it was his bladder and it was full and it wasn't draining, which was the big issue. And so they ran every test they could run and, and we switched. We started off the day talking to the gastroenterology people. And by the end of the day, we were talking to nephrologists and urologists and 
Um, I think we even had a pulmonologist in there at that point, And uh, they said that his, his kidneys, they showed us pictures of the, his kidneys, what they looked like. And they were just full of, um, they looked like little starbursts on the, on the ultrasound mm -hmm. pictures because they were just full of little cysts and, and things that weren't supposed to be there because they were very tiny and very underdeveloped. And so what they explained was that Henry um, had what's called posterior urethral valves or PUV. And it's basically this tiny, tiny flap of skin that on Henry wasn't flapping. And it was causing, um, it was causing the urine to back up into his kidneys and essentially shutting them down. And on top of that, that bladder being distended so large was actually pushing on his diaphragm and not allowing his lungs to develop the way that they should. Okay. I, I understand that. Well, let, let's settle this first. You're talking about going to Cincinnati. You live in Fort Wayne, don't you? Yes, we do. We do. So when we got that original diagnosis, um, you know, the high risk doctor here in Fort Wayne said, I'm going to send you elsewhere. And my first thought was Riley. And he said, oh, no, they can't do what you need there um, because they were expecting to have a certain type of surgery. And at that point in time, there were only two hospitals in the country that were doing that kind of work. And so it was either Cincinnati or Arizona. And we said, well, Cincinnati's within driving distance. So we're going to we're going to vote for Cincinnati. Um, and it was like three days later, I think that we were, we were there. Yeah. Okay. Now I, I understand that while you were pregnant, you actually had a couple of surgeries to help Henry's health. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So the first one, um, it all happened so rapidly once we, it was actually good Friday when we went down for the initial diagnoses and testing and all of that at Cincinnati. And the following, they gave us all of our options. Um, and then the following Tuesday, I actually underwent um, my first surgical experience, um, which was a laparotomy so that they could operate on Henry. Um, and at that point in time, the intervention that we had chosen was to basically go in and kind of make that skin flap a little bit, kind of poke through that, that flap that wasn't flapping and make it work the way that it was supposed to. We knew that it wouldn't undo the damage that was done, but we knew it would prevent any further damage um, and that we could kind of go back then and try to treat and correct and, and fix the other side effect problems, I guess. Um, so that was the first surgery and it went really well. It was a long one, but it went well and they were successful. And they had at that point in time inserted a Foley catheter basically in his bladder so that he was um, voiding his bladder just continuously. Because without that in pregnancy, right, in utero, that's the amniotic fluid. And when there's no, it's this process so that they drink in the amniotic fluid that helps their lungs develop and then they void it out through urinating. Well, Henry wasn't able to do that. And so his kidneys were backing up, his lungs weren't developing. And so we really needed to, to get rid of that urine in the bladder. And so they inserted a few little, they kind of looked like pigtail shunts. Um, and so the shunts were working and then they had the Foley catheter. And about three weeks after that surgery, because I was being continuously monitored for amniotic fluid levels. And about three weeks after that, suddenly we had a skyrocket in, um, or a drop in amniotic fluid and there wasn't any. And it had seemed that the Foley catheter, catheter had stopped working. Um, and so we went back to Cincinnati and they did an ultrasound. And sure enough, something had caused the catheter to dislodge from its original placement. And <laughs> the only thing that we could come up with at the time was that he had reached down and pulled it out. So he was being active and finicky and stubborn and feisty, even in womb. Um, Already. <laughs> and yes, but that gave us a lot of hope because we were like, okay, you know, we know that he's a fighter and we know that he's not just going to lay down on us. Um, and so they, they inserted a couple more shunts at that point in time. And then that carried us through until delivery, um, which wasn't that long after, but. Great. Great. And when was Henry born? In fact, he was born in July. Uh, so July 18th, 2014. Um, and he, his due date was in, was in September. So he came pretty early and I had gone into labor 
earlier that week, he was born on a Friday and I had gone into labor on about Tuesday. Um, and they kept trying to give me medications to slow it down and stop it. But then by Friday morning, it was pretty clear that he was going to make his entrance. And, um, it was, it was wild. There were so many people in my delivery room. I had a team for myself because I was having blood pressure issues. Um, Henry of course had his own team there ready and waiting for him. We had family in the room. We had, you know, clerical staff in the room because the doctors, I had my doctor come in that morning and he said, you know, don't get your hopes up basically. Cause we don't know, we have no idea what, what this birth is going to bring, um, which we knew going in, but we, we just prayed, we prayed hard and he made his entrance. Um, and I got to hold him for about 30 seconds and then they bundled him all up and wrapped him all up and put him in, put him in his little incubator and shipped him off to, to the ICU, the NICU ICU. Okay. Uh, and this was at, uh, this was in Cincinnati with the delivery place? Yes. Yep. In Cincinnati. So we actually delivered at the university of university hospital. Um, and then they took him over to the children's hospital, which is connected. Okay. Yeah. Now I, I understand he was in, in ICU for a long period of time. How long was he there? Very. So we were in the NICU at Cincinnati Children's Hospital for four months. And then once he was stable enough to be transferred, um, we transferred to Riley because we knew that had always been the plan that when he was healthy enough, um, we would transfer somewhere close to home, you know, that was a little bit more manageable for us. So that was that was it four months right right before Thanksgiving. Um, so we spent our first Thanksgiving and Christmas in the NICU and then right after the new year, um, it was actually at day 179 that we got to go home from the NICU. Okay. I understand that he was placed on dialysis almost instantly after his birth. He was, he was about a month old. Yeah. So that was the first like two to three weeks were crucial, um, because, we had to, to keep him alive long enough to where his body was big enough to endure the dialysis because it was pretty much 24 hour dialysis that he was on once he started. Um, because you know, they have to do it when they're that small. I mean, he was four pounds and three ounces when he was born. Um, so when they're that small, you know, they have to do it in such small, small amounts that, um, we really had to fight and make sure that he could be stable enough and strong enough to do the dialysis. So, um, but he, he made it, he hung on and it was, he was like a month and a half, I think when we finally started it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And I, I understand that initially you tried to do home dialysis. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Yeah. So, um, we did per the peritoneal dialysis or PD, which is what you can do at home. And, that was kind of my first dive into nursing a little bit um, because, you know, as the caregiver, I was basically responsible for hooking up that machine and making sure that it was all running smoothly. Um, so dialysis was essentially done by me um, and it involved hooking him up to a machine at night and it would run throughout the night while he was sleeping um, for anywhere from 10 to 12 hours, depending on how old he was um, or how, you know, how much he needed. And it was, it was great. I mean, it wasn't without its downfalls, you know, no medical procedure is, but it allowed us to have some freedom during the day because while he was hooked up to his G tube and his oxygen and all of that kind of stuff, um, we didn't have this big old dialysis machine that we were attached to. So it was, we ran with peritoneal dialysis until he was, um, a little over two years old. He was probably two and a half when we started really kind of having some issues with infections in the line. And um, then when he had his big surgery in 2016, Dr. Goggins really felt like, you know, if we move forward with peritoneal dialysis, we really stand a strong chance of injuring his peritoneal cavity, which is where that kidney, new kidney would need to go. So Dr. G said no more and switched us over to, to hemodialysis at that point. Okay. And that would have been at uh, Riley's Children in Indianapolis? Yes. Yep. Yes, indeed it was. And we, um, we had our, our training. So in order to do Lisa, what is it like for a baby to do dialysis? Yeah, that's just, 
that's just it. It's huge. And it's, it's so complicated and it's so involved um, that it was, it's, I mean, it's dangerous. I remember just frankly asking our dialysis coordinator, you know, what about DaVita dialysis? What about all these places that are seen so much closer to home? And our coordinator basically told us they would, they would kill him because they, it's pediatric dialysis is so complicated and involved and it involves so much, you know, managing and and number crunching and all of this kind of stuff that it really can be really dangerous. So, um, well, we had a wonderful coordinator. I had to do like 45 hours of training in the hospital before they would even let Henry come home to do dialysis at home. Um, and I was the only person who was allowed to touch the machine. Um, I did have one, I had a backup person who lived outside of our home. That way, if anything ever happened, you know, somebody else could run it. But yeah, it was pretty much a crime to let anybody else touch that dialysis machine. So um, it was, it, I very quickly became a nurse and, and kind of put on my like, ooh, okay, I got to pay attention and make sure I'm on it all the time for this. Okay. Now, you live in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Mm-hmm. Yes. Henry was taking dialysis per Dr. Goggins' instructions at Riley Children in Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. I looked that up. That's about 155 miles distant one way. Yep. Yes. And, and as I understand it, you were driving Henry back and forth from home to dialysis. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So when we first, when we were recovering from his, from his bladder surgery, um, which was scary, (laughs) it did not go as well as planned. Um, But when we were recovering from that and we were kind of talking about what the future would look like with dialysis at that point in time, we were driving down to the clinic six days a week. Um, And so Monday through Saturday, I was taking him down and we would leave about six o'clock in the morning and get home about four o'clock in the afternoon, um, depending on traffic, of course. (laughs) And we did that. That was the longest and hardest stretch. Eventually, once he as he started to grow, they were able to back down off of the amount of sessions that he needed to have. Um, so we were able to, the, the least amount that we were driving down there was four days a week. Um, but it was anywhere from four to six days a week, depending on, on what he needed. Um, yeah. So yeah, two out, two hours, one way, depending on traffic, two hours, the other way, it was about four to four and a half hours of travel time and about five hours of actual clinic time. And, and that would have taken place somewhere between four and six times a week. Yes. Four hours there and back, four hours on dialysis for a period of uh, four times or six times every week. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yes. It was, wow. it was intense. It was. Um, and it was, it was tiresome for most of us. Kevin and I, Kevin and I both got the experience of, of handling that and driving down there. Um, We, you know, there was a time where he was working and so I would take him down and then there was a time when I was working and and he would take him down. Um, But it was, okay, not everybody needs to see your your loose tooth, your lost tooth there, buddy. Um, But it was definitely probably one of the hardest stretches just because Henry's Henry's body was getting tired. Um, It's hard for a little to endure that much in the hemodialysis really kind of, I feel like is a little bit more intense for them. And we struggled with infections and we struggled with, you know, fluid management. Um, and so sometimes, you know, our, our day trips to, to dialysis clinic would turn into overnight trips or week long trips because we would get admitted based on, based on his numbers. Um, and that was a reality of, of every time, you know, we always had a bag packed an overnight bag packed to take with us. Okay. Now, I, I understand he was. Don't worry, Henry. I lost a few teeth too. He, he was on dialysis until approximately his fourth birthday. Mm-hmm. All right. Yes. Can you tell us, Emily, in addition to some of the things that you've mentioned, what were the other challenges that you faced with Henry while he was on dialysis? 
The big ones, the big ones were infections. Um, so there was a period of time in 2016, just prior to his bladder reconstructive surgery that, um, he contracted, I guess, um, or developed peritoneal dial or peritoneal fungal peritonitis, sorry, words. Um, okay. and so we, you know, he'd had peritonitis once in the past and then it, it developed into fungal peritonitis and he went through probably three different bouts of antibiotic. And so at that point in time, he was on PD, but every time he had to do a round of antibiotics, they would take him off and we would have to go down to the clinic for hemo. So we were, it was like hit and miss. We'd have, you know, three to four weeks of, of PD at home. And then we would have three to four weeks of hemodialysis in clinic while we were doing this round of antibiotics. And the antibiotics were me taking these giant needles and syringes and drawing up these medications and injecting it into his PD bags. And I was like doing chemistry in, in his bedroom. And um, it was just wild. But yeah, we had, so we had about three rounds of antibiotics. And then they finally figured out that one of those shunts that was placed in utero did not come out during birth. It had stayed lodged in his body. And they had said at the very beginning that it wouldn't cause any damage. It would be fine. Um, something happened, something mutated, and that fungus just stuck to that shunt. And so while we were treating the fungal infection, because the source was still in there, it just kept repopulating and kept coming back. So eventually he had to have surgery to remove that. And then once they removed that, that finally, the infections finally stopped. Um, but that was, that was hard. That was a big challenge. And then his, his bladder reconstructive surgery did not, the surgery itself went well, um, but he developed bleeding ulcer, a bleeding ulcer in the recovery process of that. And it was really scary. That was the point in time where, you know, we were having conversations in the hospital with doctors that were just ending in, I'm sorry. Um, and that's a really, that's a really horrible place to be because you never give up hope as a parent and you never stop fighting as a parent. But when the people that you have put all of your trust in, in the world don't have a next step, um, it's terrifying. And so, you know, I remember that week, the, that, that really bad week. Um, you know, <laughs> our poor families, they would get calls in the middle of the night that would say, you know, you have to come down because we don't know if he's going to make it through the night. And then he would pull through. And then the next day he would, he would be great. And then the next night he would tank again. And, um, we did that for three or four days. And then, um, there was a night that was really bad. And Kevin and I sat around his bed. Our whole family was there. We had had our pastor come down at that point. Um, and we were, we were very much at a point where we didn't know what the next six hours were going to look like. And so we prayed. We prayed with everything that we had. And we told him, we said, you know, we, we knew he was tired. And we knew that he, his body was just exhausted. He had three emergency surgeries in a two-week period and just was his little body couldn't take it anymore. And we told him, you know, you have fought so hard and you have done so well. And if you are too tired to keep going, we understand and it's okay. And God's got you and you are going to go to a place where there is no pain at all. Um, and he just, you know, squeezed our, our hands as much as he could. And we squeezed his hand and, and we left it to God. And the next morning his vitals picked up. And he, he stabled out through the night and in the morning he was a hundred percent different, you know, and we were at a point where we felt like we could breathe again. Um, and so up to, up to that point, that was the scariest part that we had had. Um, and, but he, you know, we recovered from that and we bounced back from that and we were okay then and things were kind of smooth until, until what turned out to be, thankfully, kind of towards the end of his dialysis process, I guess, um, about the end of year three, we were having to have his, his port replaced pretty frequently. The lines were not staying. Um, it kept coming out of the cuff. It kept dislodging. And we were running out of places to put it. Uh, we were getting to the point where we had about one more spot that we could put a dialysis catheter in. And beyond that, then it would just be up to God again. Um, 
so there were, there were definitely looking back at it. There, there were definitely some scary times, um, that, you know, we just think about, we just thank God. We thank God so immensely at, at how it all turned out. Wow. I, I read, um, that Henry's been operated on over 30 times. Is that a, a fair statement? It is. Um, we're probably closer to the 40 mark at this point, 40, 45 maybe. Um, but yes, he has had procedures that, and every single one of them has required anesthesia. So he has been intubated, you know, countless times. He has had finger sticks and heel sticks and head sticks and all kinds of sticks. And um, he's, he's endured it. He's endured it all. Okay. I, I understand that you and Kevin were working very hard trying to get Henry on a kidney transplant list. Yeah. Um, so the, the biggest issue was really his weight. And so he had to, to hit a certain weight marker in order for them to really say, okay, he's ready and he's eligible. Um, and so then, you know, the search, once we were, once we made it onto the active transplant list, which happened, I believe in like early or mid 2017, somewhere in there. Um, and we, there were a few times when Dr. Goggins would come down to clinic and he'd be looking, you know, and he would come, he'd come to the bed and he wouldn't say much, but he would come to the bed and he would just kind of look over Henry and he would say, you know, mm, I don't think this one's going to work. And it was like, ah, you know, you always get, we would always get so excited whenever he would walk into clinic because it was like, okay, somebody might get a kidney today. And so we had a couple of times of that, but Henry, because Henry was so small that, you know, that kidney just would have to be perfect. And, um, so, so yeah, it, it was, we had a few times that we thought it was going to be the one and, but we, we got passed over. A few false alarms. Yeah, a few, a few, um, which is, it's a different type of disappointment. You know, you experience disappointment as an individual, you experience disappointment even as a parent. Um, but when you're the parent of a, a medically fragile child, it's, it's a different kind of disappointment. Um, so that was, it was, you almost had to grieve a little bit. We had to mourn the, that loss a little bit. And so it was, it was a little difficult, but we, each time, you know, we just knew, we knew God would bring us the right kidney. Um, and gosh, he sure did. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I, I understand that Henry was able to find a donor, a living donor. Yes, which is. Uh -oh, did we lose you now? Oh, I'm still here. Okay, there you go. There we go. Okay. Henry so, was able to find a living donor. Correct. Yes, he was, and that <laughs> is probably the most exciting thing about all of this, and it's it's why I love to share our story because. Um, not only did he find a, a living donor, but our living donor was an adult. And so most of the time when I tell people that they are like, oh, wait, what? An adult can donate to a child? Because everybody just kind of assumes that a, a child would need a child's organ. Um, and that's not actually the case. So we just had to find the right adult. Um, mind you, you know, a six foot, 250 pound man was not a good Qual, you know, not a good candidate. Not a good fit. Um, no. And so we, we had been on the hunt. I had put a post out on social media. We had just a flood of responses. Um, I was overwhelmed and just blown away by the amount of people that stepped up to the plate and said, you know, I'm going to go get tested. And, um, you know, there was a lot to sift through, you know, I was, I was constantly telling people, you know, okay, well, these are, these are the, um, basic prerequisites, you know, and so if you match these prerequisites, then yes, go ahead. I would encourage you to call and, and thank you, you know, um, but a lot of people didn't match those prerequisites. And so it kind of got whittled down. And then um, when we, when we found, we found a, someone who was willing um, to donate and get tested and she made it all the way through and she was a good initial match. Um, but then we found out that her kidney, her other kidney size, well, I'm probably going to hear Gertie here in a minute. Um, her other kidney size would have been too small on its own. And so she was not able to donate. 
Um, and so we kind of felt that like gut wrenching loss again, because we were so close. Um, but we, we endured for a little bit longer and, um, I put another post out. I, I had waited a little while, but I think it was probably about six or seven months later when we were really getting to the point where it was clear that something needed to happen because we needed to do something different. And so I put another post out on social media and, um, maybe two weeks after I had done that, I got a message uh, from a very dear friend of mine and all it said was I'm a match and I'm going to donate my kidney and <laughs> it, I was so just blown away because um, this person was my very first best friend you know we we grew up together we did everything together we were inseparable um, we uh, had a, a secret you know friendship club when we were younger um, you know, we were the type of friends in grade school that teachers almost didn't want us in the same class because they knew that if we were in the same class together, like nothing was going to get done. Um, and we, you know, we had graduated from high school and just our, our lives had kind of gone different directions. And so we had kind of lost touch a little bit, but she, she reached out and it, there was no hi, hello, how are you? It was just hey, I'm a match, you know, um, I'm an initial match. I'm, I'm going to go get tested because I, I want to give Henry my, you know, my kidney. And from the moment that she sent the message, I just, I knew. I felt something inside that I just, I knew. I knew that this was going to be the one. Um, and I was, I was in the basement doing laundry, actually, when I got the message. And I just remember getting in. I just kind of fell to my knees <laughs> because it was like, uh, it was such a relief and it was such a, a blessing from God that we, we felt we had hope again and that there was maybe a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so, and, and she was, and it was great. And we went through, you know, she went through the testing process and we, six months later, we were, um, she sent that message to me. I think it was either right before Christmas or right after Christmas. And then, so in July, um, on Henry's fourth birthday, he, he got his kidney from Colleen. And, um, it, it went so well, the surgery went so well and everything just did what it was supposed to. And both of our families were there and were gathered, you know, and we were praying together and we were fellowshipping together and just spending the time in the lobby and checking on, you know, Colleen and Colleen's parents would come over and, and check on us. And, um, the whole experience was just a little, a little surreal. You know, we all gathered in Henry's room, um, we had t-shirts made <laughs> and we all gathered in Henry's room wearing our t-shirts and saying happy birthday to him, um, uh, because it was his birthday. And then, um, our pastor <laughs> let us in a rendition of victory in Jesus, because that at the time was Henry's favorite song. And so one of my favorite video clips is just this entire room of adults and, and nurses and, and doctors just singing victory to Jesus. Um, and I still get kind of choked up about it because it was just, it was such a powerful moment that there was so much God in that room that I just felt such a peace. And I still feel that sometimes there is, God does such powerful things and he moves such big mountains that um, we got to see him move a mountain that day. And okay. it was, it was miraculous. And this, just for the record, this is your friend, Colleen Collins. Yes. Yep. And so you knew her since kindergarten. You were best yeah. friends. You joined the Girl Scouts together. The yes. first time you got grounded, you were with her. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uncle Jim does his homework. <laughs> yeah, she she really was. Um, you know, we we even had a, a secret our secret club. We called ourselves the Bash Sisters, and so we would kind of like go run around on the playground together and and help people. Um, not be in trouble, I guess, from bullies. Um, so all those bad boys. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so there, no, I keep they, seeing a question that pops up about where where can we go to find information about uh, pediatric kidney patients and my um, friend Candy. Yes, so I I love the AAKP um, website, but IU Health and Riley Children's Hospital, their nephrology department has so much information, and they are so knowledgeable about. Um, pediatric kidney disease. I know that um, Riley's um, nephrology and urology units are ranked among like the top 10 in the nation. And so um, 
I just always, I always encourage people, if you have questions, talk to the people at IU Health and at Riley, because they are so knowledgeable in what they do. So knowledgeable. The, Candy, just so you know, the head of nephrology there is a friend of mine. His name is Dr. David Haynes, H-A-I-N-E-S. Mm -hmm. The guy that did um, Henry's transplant, he also did my transplant, by the way, Dr. William Doggins. He's, he's been on our show. We'll have him back again sometimes. He's the rock star of kidney transplant doc in our state. Um, we call him back in 2000. He's done a 2,000 transplant. Mm -hmm. I don't know who in the but somebody's unhappy. Um, so, so tell me, um, what were the challenges with Dr. Goggin uh, planning? What kinds of problems did we discuss? Um, there, yeah, sorry about the background noise. She's actually okay. quite excited. That's her excited voice. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, the biggest challenge for, for Dr. G with Henry was um, – Kind of his his real estate in his belly area because he'd had so many surgeries he had so much scar tissue really finding a good spot for for the new kidney to go um and then his size in general and so um the that that was just the biggest thing and he knew that when he went in to do the surgery that it was going to be a navigation process and um it was it was pretty tedious i think we were we were in the or for uh, eight or nine hours. I can't even remember now. It was a long day. Um, but that was the biggest obstacle was really kind of just kind of getting in and navigating through all of that scar tissue and, and finding the best spot for that kidney. Well, you know, if, if Dr. G couldn't do it, nobody could do it. Exactly. He, yeah. He's the best. I, I, really I, will, I will say that he is the best. Um, I put a kidney page together for you guys for, yeah. for him, you know, um, you know, help find a, a kidney for uh, Henry. And you changed the name of the kidney page after the transplant, uh, The Marvelous Adventures of Henry and Mill, M-I-L. Can you mm -hmm. explain what, what that symbolizes, what that's all about? Yeah. So Mill is Henry's kidney's name. Um, and we, we chose Mill because we have – from the time that Henry was really little, um, his dad has always called him Jimmy Miller, or we would call him Mill for short. And um, so we just kind of thought, you know, it's it's a great nickname and it's fun. And, you know, what if we now, you know, now we call Henry Jimmy Miller and we call his kidney Mill. Um, and so it was just, we knew he, we wanted him to have a name. And so we just gave him something fun that was an extension of, of what we called Henry when he was little. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure where Jimmy Miller comes from. I think it was something from a movie that Kevin has always really liked. Um, so he's always just called him that. Um, but yeah, so it was just a fun play on a nickname that we called Henry for a long time. Okay. I've read articles about Henry in the IU health blog. Mm -hmm. I've read articles about Henry in USA today. I wrote articles about Henry in the Chicago Tribune. Mm -hmm. But the thing that always excites me is I understand that you were on the Today Show on NBC. Is that right? Yes. Tell us a little yep. bit about that. Yeah, that was probably one of the coolest experiences I'd ever had. Um, so the media team at IU Health contacted me and said, hey, you know, um, Good Morning America has caught wind of this, has caught wind of the story. They want to talk to you. Um, and so they did. They came to the producers from the Megyn Kelly show, which is the Megyn Kelly portion of the of the Today Show, um, came and they did an interview. And um, we were in one of the parts of, of University Hospital, I think, over there. It wasn't actually at Riley. It was next door. Um, they just they asked a bunch of questions and we got to share our story and we got to talk about we got to talk about living donation and, and how real it is and how essential it is and how vital it is that, you know, if you're willing and able that you register to be an organ donor, um, because there's so many different ways that, that you can help. Um, but yeah, that was, it was a lot of fun. We got to share our story, the, the ups and downs and, um, 
we got to, to bring awareness on a platform that was pretty big. And that was probably one of the most important things just because, you know, I still get, get questions. People still look at me in shock when I, when I say that he has a kidney from an adult. So, um, people don't think about kids having kidney disease and it's, but it's real. And it's so, so important that people know, because if they know, then they can help in some way. Okay. Talk to us a little bit about the challenges that, that Henry's been dealing with since the time of his transplant. Yeah. So we, you know, I will say medically, um, knock on wood, his recovery went well. Um, we had in true Henry fashion, um, he likes to throw curveballs, And so in true Henry fashion, about a week out from transplant, um, we had some weird kind of things happening and, um, didn't really know. I don't think anybody really knows still at this point what happened exactly. Uh, but it, things just weren't working the way that they were supposed to. So we, but he recovered from that and they were able to get it all kind of figured out. Um, and since then, really his biggest struggle has just been catching up. Um, you know, when you have that many surgeries done on your abdominal region, there's no muscle retention or muscle tone there at all. And so getting him caught back up to where he needs to be physically and emotionally um, just really is our, our biggest struggle now. And so we do a lot of therapies, you know, we're involved in speech therapy and physical therapy and occupational therapy. And we also see another speech therapist for um, feeding issues. He was recently diagnosed with um, it's called EOE. It's basically esophageal, Oh, I'm not going to get this right. As, as, I'm not even going to try it because I'm going to butcher it. Um, but okay. basically, there there is a gathering of cells, kind of, and then it causes excessive inflammation of his esophagus, and so it makes it hard for him to swallow food. Um, he it it kind of resembles GERD a little bit, and so he has trouble with you know in, impacted food getting impacted, choking on food, swallowing food, food coming back up. Um, and we don't know if it's being caused by diet because he doesn't really eat very much anyway. Uh, we don't know if it's being caused by, uh, reactions with his medications because there's science that show that transplant medications can cause EOE. Um, we don't know if it's behavioral, if it's, if it's a trauma response, you know, from being intubated. Um, and so, we um, are just, it's brand new. And so we're just kind of starting to, to work through it and, and figure out what the best course of treatment is. We're going to start with a, a PPI, a protein pump inhibitor. Um, and so, which of, of course, you probably understand the struggle with insurance. Insurance is battling us on wanting to pay for it because it's an over-the-counter medication. Um, but of course, Henry can't swallow a pill. So it, you know, it looks like, can we, can we get a different form of it? Can we break open a capsule and sprinkle it over something? So it's, it's a process. It's always a process to try to get a new medication. Um, but those are, those are the biggest things that we're, we're really kind of struggling with. Um, I just actually had a case conference with his teachers and, and the staff at school requesting, um, an IEP so that we could have some services done in school. And they actually told me that they would not pursue it because academically he is just on point. His, his test scores are all really good. Um, he's doing well socially at school. And so uh, we are, we're just kind of, we're battling all of those things on our own at home um, outside of the school. Not that they're not supportive, they're wonderful and we love his school. And they've offered to implement anything that his therapists um, ask. But at this point in time, we're just doing it outside of the school. So um, it's, a, it's a wild world to, to try to navigate all of the different services. And um, I'm thankful for what I do as a profession, because had I not had my feet wet in that prior to all of this, I would probably feel like I was drowning. <laughs> um, because there's just there's so much, you know, it's, it's making sure that all of his appointments are lined up. And all of the medications and the feeding schedule. And so it's, it's a lot. I mean, it, it, it's medical management, you know, medical case management 101 basically. But um, those are, those are really the things that he's battling since transplant. So 
but his kidney, gosh, you know, his labs always look good. And at clinic, they're always so happy with how it looks. And um, it really is just doing doing what it's supposed to do. Did, did you guys give his kidney a nickname? Um, Mill. Yeah. Mill. We just, okay. We just call him Mill. I call mine Woody because all the men in my family, our middle names are Woodrow. So oh, I named nice. him kidney after my dad. Yes. That's awesome. So. Have, have you been, been told whether or not Henry may need additional kidney transplants in the future? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. So Dr. Dr. G did tell us that the shelf life for um, a pediatric kidney is typically about 10 to 12 years. Um, once they, it's like once they hit that puberty, their body just goes through so many changes that a lot of times, the, you know, the post pubescent body um, and that kidney just don't mesh well. And so they, they start to see some signs of rejection usually after that. So he kind of, of prepped us for, you know, maybe needing another one when he's a young adult or an, an older teenager, young adult, um, and then even possibly a third kidney transplant later on in life as well as an older adult. So he is looking at the possibility of needing two more kidneys um, in order to, you know, for a lifespan of 60 to 70 years. Um, but, you know, you never know. You never know. I, when we were, um, okay, you're sweet. Thank you. <laughs> um, when we were going through the process of all of this and people were reaching out, you know, I would get messages from people that would say, you know, my son has had his kidney for 30 years now. You know, he got it when he was 10 years old and, and he's, he's still, it's still going strong. And so we know, you know, that God's in control and he's, that kidney is going to work as long as God needs it to work. Um, and when he does need another one, um, mine's being kind of kept on standby. So um, I, I'm a match. I'm a universal donor. I'm, I'm an O negative And so we are, I'm keeping myself healthy <laughs> so that when he needs it, he can have mine. Okay. You mentioned school. Talk to us about a little bit of the ins and outs uh, with Henry and, and, and school. I, you've mentioned things in um, webinars with the AAKP about mm -hmm. 504s and IEP and stuff I don't understand. So <laughs> could you explain what goes on with, with that when you're, you're trying to put Henry in school? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's all definitely diving into the special needs world in, in the educational world, um, which I was, I'm blessed to have a, a teacher as one of my moms. And um, she, she has been such an asset. She's been so helpful in navigating this process um, that we, I knew we were going to need to seek some special resources in school. Um, and so he did, his first school experience was actually last year. Uh, he was able to do a year of pre-kindergarten and he was blessed with a wonderful teacher at a wonderful school and it really prepared him to do to do full day kindergarten this year. And so um, that's where we're at. He is, he is a full day kindergartner here at a boy elementary and he loves it. Um, we, you know, when he, last year when he went to school, he had an in-home um, health nurse that actually went with him. And so she was able to take care of all of his medical needs at school. It was a half day at that point. And so she was able to meet all of his medical needs. Um, but we realized, you know, at school, he's so independent that he just was adamant. He's like, I want to go to school by myself. I don't need somebody to go with me. And so we, we partnered with the school at the beginning of the year and I just laid it all out. I said, this is what we need to be successful at school. You know, can you come alongside us and help us with this? And um, they were fantastic. The nurse that we have at our school um, is so helpful and she's such a blessing. She's willing to do anything she needs to for Henry. Um, and we, we've really kind of, we've rearranged some things so that there's not so much hands-on stuff that they have to do at school. Um, we handle all of his G-tube feeds here at home. He does still have a G-tube um, because of his feeding issues and probably realistically will for the next couple of years. Um, so we just try to, we try to make it so that that doesn't have to be touched while he's at school. Um, but he does have, he has a, a urine collection system that he wears instead of voiding, you know, out through his urethra. 
And she's very helpful with that. Whenever Henry has trouble, you know, opening and closing it, she's very helpful with that. Um, and I, I had hoped to get some extra services um, with for Henry in school. But in order to do that, you have to have either an IEP or a 504 plan. Um, the 504 is just kind of the medical version. It's kind of like saying, okay, this child academically, do, you know, he doesn't have a learning disability, but he does have a health impairment that has caused a delay in development. Um, but they felt that he, he doesn't have enough of a delay at this point, I guess. Um, and that academically he's, he's performing too well in order to pursue um, special needs services at this point in time. Not that he might not need them in the future, but where he's at right now is on point enough that they're going to just let it ride out. So, um, okay. yeah. Talk to us a little bit about how your family and the school is dealing with COVID issues, COVID-19 in the age of Cyrus the virus and, and Henry. <laughs> We, you know, we thought when we went to our clinic appointment prior to school starting last summer um, or earlier in the summer, we were really expecting to hear, you know, go with virtual learning. You know, you need to do learning at home. And um, I got to give it to Riley and IU Health. They did their research and they really looked at the numbers and they said, you know, we're seeing we're seeing kids with kidney patients get COVID. But we're also seeing kids with kidney patients recover from COVID really easily not maybe not easily but they weren't quite as overburdened by it as what i think everybody was expecting and so they encouraged us to do to do school in person and he was so excited i remember telling him the day that we went i was like buddy guess what you're gonna get to go to school and he was like what can i ride the bus and i said do you want to ride the bus and he said yeah and i said can you ride the bus and they said sure and i said okay so um, he just dove right in, you know, um, we've, we've done the e-learning days. If he's, if he's sick or if he has a cough or anything like that, you know, we stay home. Um, but he has been healthy, knock on wood, um, and has been able to be at school when, when it's been open. So um, we're, we're kind of curious to see how the rest of the year is going to go. Um, the middle schools now in our district are doing e-learning only for the rest of the semester. So, um, you know, we'll see. It's all different. I know our school and our district in particular, masks are part of the dress code this year. So, you know, it's a mask all the time when he's at school. They are, um, they started off the year doing lunch in the lunchroom at specific tables. And now I think they're kind of morphing it to where they're eating lunch, maybe in their classrooms a little bit. Um, but his school has done a fantastic job of just staying on top of it. You know, they ask teachers to quarantine or kids to quarantine if they've been exposed even. Um, and so it's really kept the amount of cases, positive cases that we have seen in our school to a low amount, which has been fantastic, really fantastic. Okay. I noticed that advocacy, particularly for pediatric kidney patients is important to you. Can, can you tell us why and some of the things you've done as an advocate? Yeah, well, you know, I love working with kids um, and it's always been a passion of mine. Um, and I think because just kids in general, they're our future and they sometimes can't advocate for themselves. And so um, I have always had a passion for speaking on behalf or for people who cannot speak for themselves. And um, there's there's a lot, you know, when you are... I've learned a lot about kidney disease and, and you probably, probably know this from your experience that there's, it's not an outward disease. It's very much an inward disease. And so when Henry was on dialysis, it was a lot of just observation of his body of, you know, cause he couldn't always tell us, I don't feel good or I have a headache or, you know, things that we would notice as adults of signs of our fluids being off or maybe something not working. Um, kids don't know that. And so for me, it was just constantly observing him and, and getting used to his body signs and his body language. 
Um, and so there were, there was more than one occasion when I, I would have to grab one of our nurses and say, Hey, we need to turn this machine off or back it down or slow it down or something because, you know, his eyes are sinking in, he's getting lethargic, he's getting tired. He doesn't want to talk as much. Um, you know, he's laying his head down and those are all things that he couldn't tell me. And so, um, it just really made me kind of wake up to the fact that our kids need us to speak out for them. And not only do they need us to speak out for them, but they need us to act on their behalf and to make sure that we are paving a way for them to have clear futures. And um, especially with pediatric kidney disease, there are so, so many. I know that the Riley Clinic is overflowing right now with, with kids who are hooked up to machines and they've had to add clinic days and they've had to add beds. <laughs> and, um, you know, I know that kind of kidney surgeries kind of got put on the back burner, transplant surgeries kind of got put on the back burner for a hot second with COVID. Um, but it's just, it's so important that people know that it's real. It happens. Kidney disease is not something that just affects adults. Um, and that there, there is, there is a hope it, it, you know, kidney disease, there's no cure for it. Um, but a transplant is the best treatment available and it's an option for kids. And I think that that's the biggest thing that people get hung up on sometimes is I think they think that transplant isn't an option for kids or it's not as likely for kids because, you know, the organ would have to come from another child. And that's just not the case. And so just making people aware of that, of you know, hey, you've got two and you only need one. So share your spare <laughs> um, because it could even, you know, it could go to a child. And there are so many different avenues of donation, living donation now. There, you know, you can do a kidney swap where you can, you know, agree to give it to somebody else. You can give it to a total stranger. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be the direct, you know, where Colleen did, where she signed up to be our donor. Um, there's just so many different avenues. And so just letting people know that that is out there, especially with kidney disease, you know, it's it's there and it's available. And I think making people aware of it just opens up the doors and it opens up the opportunities for more kids to get transplants. Excellent. Um, is there anything today that you would like to talk to us about that I didn't ask you about? Is there anything that you would like to add? Did um, I miss anything? I don't, I don't think so. Oh my goodness. It's been, it's just been such an honor to talk about our story. You know, um, our family mantra is kind of turn your test into your testimony and what a testimony it is. Um, and it's, you know, I, I've, Henry has been such a teacher and he has been such a motivator. And the one thing I guess I would say is, um, there is hope. There is always hope. And there, there is, there is a hope that, um, you know, I, I didn't always necessarily truly believe in. Um, I've always believed in God, but my, my personal faith was not as strong, you know, as, as it is now. And Henry, Henry introduced me to that. Um, because when you get to a point where as a parent, you have no one else to lean on, but God, God is there. God's always there. And um, so I would just, I would encourage anybody out there who is struggling with not having any hope, um, re reach out and reach up and throw his name out there because Jesus is the most powerful name in the world and there is not anything that can stand against him. Um, and so that is a hundred percent, you know, who we give credit for Henry being here today. And, um, he has, I feel like God has given me the power to use my voice. And if there's one thing I can say to, to kidney parents out there today or parents, any caregivers caring for a pediatric patient, use your voice as a parent. Um, because while we are surrounded by experts in our medical field, as parents, you are the expert of your child. And while one thing might work for one patient, um, I'm always a believer in, in trial and error. Um, but you have to, you have to be willing to use your voice for your child and just stand up and know that you're never alone. Um, there is, there's always someone who's available to answer questions. 
I'm available. <laughs> you know, um, I'm involved in a couple of different Facebook pages and run the marvelous adventures of, of Henry and Mill Facebook page. And um, this is parents of uh, kidney kids. Parents of kidney kids. Yes, is is one of the biggest groups that I'm involved in. And, you know, it's it's just a wonderful resource to be able to go and post a question. You know, I've, I've done that before where I've just gotten, I've felt like I've tried everything and nothing is, is working to get them to eat. And I go to the page and I post my issue. And within an, a half an hour, I have people from all over the world commenting and saying, yeah, we've experienced this too. You know, because you get to a point in this journey where it can be very isolating and you feel like you're the only one walking through it. Um, but then you take a step back and you realize, no, <laughs> you know, we've got, there are so many people that are actually experiencing this and walking this journey. And there are so many people that struggle with something else. And so, um, you know, I, I hope that my words and my testimony make somebody else feel like they're not alone in it. Um, so I, I'm always an advocate for self-care. And I feel like part of that is, is not isolating and reaching out and being a part of something that can just restore and refuel you as a caregiver um, because it's, it's an intense job. Well, Emily, I thank you so much for taking time to talk with us tonight, my friend. And I thank you for the, the webinars you've done with me and for me for the American Association of Kidney Patients. Please check Emily out. And uh, I appreciate you taking time. That's Thank you, our show Jim. for tonight. Oh, you're welcome. No, no problem. I'm just really <laughs> happy you could do this. Yes, um, I love it. I love sharing it and love getting to talk with you. So, thank you. Thank you. Next week, Dr. Holly Kramer is back with us from the NKF. Uh, she's bringing the head dietitian of the NKF with her and an independent dietitian. And we're going to have breaking news about nutrition and Medicare and getting you a dietitian. So you don't want to miss that show. Until then, this is your Uncle Jim. Peace and love, everybody. <laughs>